Hello, Springs Church family. Pastor Zach here. Thank you for tuning in to this online message. I want to encourage you that if you have found this message, Well, I am glad that we could take a minute to greet one another this morning. Um, I encourage you to, uh, to continue fellowshipping after the service and all throughout the week, connecting with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, last week, we started a new sermon series called Living, where we're talking about uh, our living faith and living a life that is pleasing to God. And we're going to be working through 1 Peter chapter 1. And as I've been reading through First and Second Peter, so many times this idea of, of living comes up over and over again, that we're called to have a living hope and a living faith. Uh, we're called living stones. Um, and so this idea, are we really living into and living out the faith that we have? And are we doing that in the days that we have left? Are you living out your faith today, or are we just saying, well, someday when things work out, I'll really begin to live faithfully. You know, when things get easier, or when I get this situated, or, you know, when, I, when I'm done with this, then I'll really begin to live into what God has called me to do. The reason why we're talking about this sermon series and this idea of living as we work through 1 Peter chapter 1 is, is really because none of us know how many days we have. We don't know how many days we will be blessed with whether it's one day or 10,000 days. Uh, 10,000 days is a little over 27 years. Uh, there are some people in this room that have probably over 30,000 days left, which is a little over 80 years. Um, and are we living, those of us that are here now, are we living in a way that maybe somebody who is going to be alive 80 years from now, are we living in a way that's going to encourage their faith? Are we living in a way that is going to be an example to them? Are you living in a way now that in 80 years someone is going to look back and be like, oh yeah, I remember how they showed up week after week and they would ask me how I'm doing and we would sing songs together and I still remember those songs or we talked about these things or one time after church this happened. Are, are we living in a way where we're not only living into our faith now but we're affecting the faith of generations to come? And as a church, as the body of Christ here in this place, are we living in a way that is going to impact generations? Not just as individuals, but as a collective. Are we making decisions that honor and glorify God? How are you living out the days you've been given? Last week, we looked at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, and we talked about if we have our identity in Christ, then there are certain characteristics that come with that. That if our identity is found in Jesus, certain characteristics will be present in our lives. And uh, you know, we... Peter starts talking to these Christians who have been scattered from their homes. And so he, he gives them these characteristics. He calls them things like scattered exiles, which not only was very literal because they had fled their homes because of persecution for their faith, but also a reminder for us that this place is not our home, that we're here temporarily. So are we living as foreigners and exiles in this place? And are we living in a way where we long to return home, knowing that every day what we do here matters? Um, we talked about how uh, that God says that like, he sees us, that before we even realized what was going on in our lives, that he already knew what we would be facing, that you're seen, that you've been saved through your faith in Jesus, and that you're being made holy, you're being sanctified. These are characteristics present in those who find their identity in Jesus. And hopefully we found some encouragement from that. Uh, today, as we continue to work through 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to talk about verses 8 through 12, and today we're going to discuss joy. Um, everybody loves joy. I like to talk about joy. Uh, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. <laughs> come on, come on. Everybody's supposed to scream, where? Where? As a kid, that was one of my favorite songs. Um, I didn't sit that well during church, so if we ever sang that song, I got to stand up and scream, where? It's the only part that I like to do, right? Right? Got the joy down in our hearts. Where? Down in my heart to stay. Usually we talk about joy during the Advent season as we prepare for Christmas. We talk about themes like hope and, uh, and things like uh, love and joy. So we discuss joy as we prepare for the Christmas season, and, uh, and really a lot of times 
Uh, that's what people, when they talk about, oh, I just love that spirit of Christmas that so many people have. They're talking about joy. Because as Christmas approaches, you are looking forward to something, and you're excited for it. You're ready to celebrate it. Get-togethers with family. Maybe we're going to open up presents. Maybe it's just that everyone seems to be a little bit better connected during the Christmas season. And so you're looking forward to something. That spirit of anticipation has a lot to do with joy. But today, we're going to talk about joy outside of Advent and Christmas and how joy is fundamental to our faith in Jesus. And that when we have a faith, when we know who we are in the Lord, that joy is the result of it. Uh, As we approach this topic of joy, I want to give you three questions of reflection to think about this week. So take some time, consider them, think about them. Maybe take a moment with a cup of coffee in the morning or, you know, something nice to drink in this cool weather during the evening and consider these reflection questions. And uh, I, I encourage you, if you don't journal, like maybe try it. Try writing these down and answering them truthfully from your heart. How do I explain joy? That if someone were to ask me, because they know I'm a follower of Jesus, that I find my identity in Christ, how do I explain joy to them? What would I say? And then consider, is there a difference between joy and happiness? That if I'm happy, do I also have joy? Or if I joy, do I have to be happy? Or what does that look like? And then finally, is joy important to me and why? I throw the why in there. It is one question, by the way. Because if I say, is joy important to me, you could always just take the easy route and say yes or no, right? Uh, I did take one year of yearbook, and I learned don't ask questions like that if you're interviewing someone. It's about all I know. Uh, Christy, you can tell me how to better do that. But uh, is joy important to you? You know, as a, as a teen, I'd just be like, yes. That's it, right? <laughs> Explain why. Think about it. Write it down. Consider it. Is joy important to me? Think about those things, and... If you take time to consider them, I think you might be amazed, hopefully convicted about what the Holy Spirit reveals in your heart and your life. Now, I will admit, in thinking about this, I I readily admit I do struggle with joy. Um, I'm better at hope than I am at joy. (laughs) And uh, there are times where I can be a little bit of a naysayer, uh, that I focus on just the negative things. Even if there's a great success, I see the things that weren't achieved instead of what was. And it's hard for me to really have joy sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. I'm better at hope. Because at hope, no matter the situation, I know that God is at work. It can be something that's terrible and tragic, but I know that the scripture tells us that God can work all things for the good of those who believe. So I can have hope in every situation. But I do struggle with joy. Now, as we consider joy, it will help us to define joy so that we're all on the same brainwave kind of as we dig into Scripture. Um, And so we ask the question, this is helpful for me whenever I'm working through something. I ask questions like who and what, why, where, those kind of questions. And I do that a lot in my sermons. So the first thing that we're going to look at is what is joy? And is there some kind of definition we should have of it? This is one that is not only biblical as well as theological, meaning that we get it based off of Scripture, not just individual parts of Scripture. Um, But what is joy? And this definition of joy, other pastors have used things that are very similar. I found found some of this uh, kind of in a a commentary talking about joy. Uh, So maybe you have seen this or heard this, or you might see it elsewhere if you really try to dig into joy. Um, joy. So this isn't just my definition. Joy is a sense of well-being that is dependent on Jesus. It's dependent on Jesus and what he has accomplished rather than my circumstance. Joy is an intentional choice, and it is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, because it's many times helpful to talk about what something not only is, but what it is not, joy is not happiness, because happiness results from favorable circumstances. Joy is something that you and I can have regardless of our circumstances in life. Because joy is founded in something and in someone who is greater than me. It's founded in something and someone greater than me, greater than my circumstances, and greater than anything that this world might have to offer. Joy is dependent on Jesus. 
not on you, not on me. The joy in your life is not dependent on another person, not your spouse, not your partner, not your friend, not your family. It's dependent on God. Happiness, however, is all about my situation and my circumstance. Happiness is, I'm happy that the Chiefs are 2-0 and right now. Pretty happy about that. They're doing really well, right? I mean, that first game was a little, like, didn't know, right? But they're doing great. Chiefs are 2-0. and If they lose to the Colts today, probably not going to be as happy, right? It's dependent on circumstance. The Colts, by the way, they're 0-1-1, and like they tie, like, the Chiefs should win. But every game, you're like, are they going to actually show up and play or not? Maybe they're going to have to wait until the very end and pull something out. Like, happiness and joy can be experienced at the same time, but happiness is dependent on circumstance because if the Chiefs lose today, I'm just going to go back to, you know what, I knew it. I knew it, right? We've had it too good too long. That's ha- that happiness is dependent on circumstance. Joy is different. Your happiness doesn't really have an effect on your joy, or at least it shouldn't, when you know who you are in Christ. So let's dig into this passage from 1 Peter, uh, verses 8 and 9. So Paul is writing to these Christian believers, and he's already given just such, such powerful stuff in the first seven verses. And he continues it. Like, this is some thick, like, meaty stuff. And he says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now... You believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. It's talking about people who believe in Jesus. Even though you don't see him, you love him. And you're filled with joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, which is the salvation of your souls. Two two small scriptures. We're going to look at that and we're going to try to ask the question, who can have joy? Because I think this verse tells us. I think this verse exposes who can have joy. Who can have joy? It's those who believe in and love Jesus. It says, even though you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, you believe in him. And because of that, you're filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Those who believe in and love Jesus can be filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. So who, who can have joy? Well, yes, the verse says that, but that means anyone who believes in Jesus Christ for the salvation of their souls. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter if you have some longing in your heart or your life. It doesn't matter if you are battling with something that tears you down again and again. You can still experience joy when you believe in and love Jesus. When you choose each day to follow Jesus, because I do think that it is a daily choice. It is a daily choice whether or not I'm going to wake up and say, God, today I'm second. And you're going to be first in my life. And I want to follow your will and your way in this world. That, God, I'm not going to lean on my own understanding today because every time I do, I mess up big. So I'm going to trust in you. And that takes a lot of faith, God, because I don't know where you're leading me and I don't know what exactly I'm doing. But I'm going to trust that you will guide me through my days. I'm going to fill my life with your holy word. I'm going to hide your word in my heart. I'm going to go to you in prayer. And as Paul tells us, I'm going to go to you continually in prayer about everything because nothing is too small or too big for you, God. I believe in and love Jesus. Because of that, I can be filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. When we choose to live in that way, our eyes can be opened to what living really is about. Now, how does this happen? How does this happen? And how does that joy come to be? Because I think that's really where the rubber meets the road. Right now, this is mainly cerebral, right? We're talking about what joy is and who can have it and everything else. But how do we get that really to grow and and be part of our lives? I think the verse that we have read, it, it reveals that we experience joy as the result of a saving faith. It's a saving faith in Jesus. For you're receiving the end result of your faith. A faith that has been preached to you, a faith that's been shared to you, a faith that's been given as an example to you, not only by the cloud of witnesses that surround you in this place and the people that came before you, but the generations that came before you and the generations that came before that. In our hymnal, there's a song. I think it's on number 555. The only reason I remember that is because it's the same number, right? 555. Um, In our hymnal, there's this song. I didn't know it until I looked in the hymnal. 
uh, it is uh, forward through the ages. Forward through the ages in an unbroken line. That's the, that's the story of our faith. That your faith doesn't come just from you, your own thoughts, your own ideas. That your faith has been passed along to you by the saints that have come before you. Yes, the Holy Spirit guides, leads, and convicts and opens your eyes and your ears. But someone had to share that message with you. How does it come to be? It comes through a saving faith in Jesus. Not only is that a reminder to have your eyes and ears open to the faith that is being shared with you by others, it gives us a reminder and hopefully conviction, how am I sharing my faith? How am I sharing my faith with the people around me? It's the result of a saving faith. And I know that that sounds simple. Right? That sounds like a Sunday school answer. How do you have joy? You just got to have faith. Right? In Sunday school, if you only ever give the answer Jesus, they can't tell you you're wrong. Right? That's what this feels like when you say it comes from a saving faith. But my friends, when you realize what God has done, the sin he has saved you from, the brokenness he has lifted you from, not by your own power. I didn't have to earn it. I didn't have to, I didn't have to pay my own way. I didn't have to say, God, I will prove to you that I'm worthy of your love. God showed up anyway. We talked about that last week, that while we were still sinners, Jesus came for us. I remember the first time that my faith really came to life and I began living into an identity in Jesus. I grew up going to church. Um, I professed Jesus at a younger age. I was baptized. If anyone asked, yes, I was a Christian. But when I went to youth camp in seventh grade, I'm there with hundreds of other teenagers and we're singing and we're worshiping and we're goofing off and getting in trouble, right? And we're, we're hiding what we're doing because, we, you know, we don't want to get caught at camp and get sent home early. That was the big threat, right? But one night there was someone that was talking about what your faith really is. And they explained the gospel in a way that made sense to me. It finally wasn't just something I heard in church. It wasn't an altar call for some lost sinners that like, well, I grew up to church. It's not me. They explained the gospel in a way that clicked in my heart and in my brain. And my eyes were open and my faith came alive. And it's like I began actually living. I grew up in Kansas. We went to camp in Nebraska, and it was like a seven-hour drive. So I'm in a van ride back with my friends on the way back, talking about camp, talking about this. Did you get a girlfriend? Oh, my goodness. You wanted to hold my hand? Like, it's seventh grade, right? Um, we stop at a truck stop to fuel up. The person driving is putting gas in the van. All my friends, we're all going inside. And uh, for some reason, I stopped, and there's this couple that's filling up with fuel. And uh, at the time, I thought that they were old. They're probably college age. I mean, <laughs> it was a younger couple. Um, but you know, you're 12, 13 years old. You, everybody's old. And for some reason, I just I asked them how they were doing. They said, fine. And I began to ask them, do you know who Jesus is? And we started talking about Jesus. I have no idea why I stopped. You see, as a kid, and still, like, I battle with insecurities, uh, self-doubt a feeling of people judging me, uh, I deal with anxiety issues. And I mean, as a teenager, you're insecure automatically. Like, it's just that period of life. And in that moment, I didn't care what they thought about me. I didn't care that maybe they were thinking, what's this weird kid from, like, why is he talking to me? I didn't care about any of that. I wanted to share with them what I had experienced and who Jesus was. And when the conversation was done after two to three minutes, because I had to go inside, use the bathroom, etc., said goodbye, they said see you later, like, even though I'm never going to see him again probably. I don't know if that conversation about faith made any impact in their life, but I know that I walked away not worried about my happiness. What are they thinking about me? Are they talking about me on their drive? Did I make a difference in their life? I didn't. It wasn't a worry about whether or not I made a difference in their life. Instead, there was joy in that I shared my faith with someone, and I'm trusting that God had an impact in their life. It's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness was all dependent on me. Joy was all about living out my faith in Christ. I just lost my place. <laughs> so my friends, when we talk about joy, how does it come about? It comes through a saving faith that is alive and active. Alive and active in your life. And that kind of faith, my friends, it is connected to and intertwined with salvation. It's a saving faith, 
faith that results in salvation that comes straight from verse 9. That the end result of your faith is the salvation of your souls. And that causes joy. Causes joy to form, to be birthed in your life and your heart. To paraphrase one of my favorite bands, I, I guess I say favorite bands, but it's just a good band, Newsboys. Um, probably listened to this song while I was at camp, one of their older songs. You give me joy that's unspeakable, and I like it. And I like it. My friends, when you've placed your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you commit to walking in His ways every day, even though knowing it's going to be difficult, you're probably going to fail, and there's people that are going to say, I don't know why you're doing that, I don't know why you're saying that, or why you're living like that, or not living like us. Your joy... Your joy is going to be there because it's based in Jesus, not in you. And the Holy Spirit will come alive in your life. The Holy Spirit will be present to lead you and guide you because that's the next part of this. If you have a saving faith that results in salvation, then Scripture promises us that Jesus will send his Holy Spirit to empower you to live in his will and his way. A saving faith results in salvation and joy is a fruit or a result of the Holy Spirit in your life. Galatians 5. If you want to know more than nuts and bolts of how do I live out my faith, Galatians chapter 5 covers quite a bit. I encourage you to read it. You'll probably be convicted by it. I always am. But in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It continues to say that against such things there is no law. For those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with all of its passions and desires. I'm not living controlled by my passions and desires anymore. I'm going to live in step with the Holy Spirit of God. That's not easy, but it's worth it. But since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit of God. My friends, joy makes such a difference. Now, if you're listening to this message and you're thinking like, yeah, you're saying a lot about joy, but I haven't really... That's, this is not for me right now in my life. What you're preaching just isn't clicking. To that, if that's you today, please know that it might not be in this moment. That in this moment, the fruit of the Spirit, maybe there's something that you just... I don't have that in my life right now. It's not that I'm not trying. It's not that I don't want it. It just doesn't seem to be there. Maybe joy seems more inaccessible than it seems inexpressible to you. Please know that the amazing thing about joy is that you can begin to experience joy before you experience joy. I know that doesn't make sense unless you've been through that. But here's the amazing thing about joy is that joy points forward to what is to come. So if you're in the middle of a circumstance right now or something you're stuck in, or maybe it's your marriage or your job, maybe it's a sin you've been wrestling with that you know you need to let go of and give it to God. Know that the joy of the Lord is there and waiting for you. And you can begin to, to experience a little bit of joy before you really experience joy because joy points forward. This is an idea that I think also comes from what we have read from 1 Peter. You see, concerning the salvation that we can experience, concerning this salvation, the prophets, meaning in the Old Testament, these people that live for God and live by the Spirit of God, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was yet to come, they searched intently and with great care for it, trying to find out the time and circumstances in which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. The Holy Spirit of God was already showing people that Jesus would come and something amazing was going to happen, and they lived for that. They preached it, they shared it, they looked forward to it. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. They were living out their faith in God, not just for themselves, but for what was to come. And when they spoke of the things that have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you through the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, my friends, even the angels long to look into these things. That's a big way of saying, listen, the great story of the Bible, all throughout the Old Testament, everything that has been preached before Jesus, all pointed to Jesus. And that salvation that you are experiencing, the salvation you have received, 
even the angels longed to know what God was up to way back then. It's what's been revealed to you. That the Messiah, the one who delivers us from sin and death, he has come for us. If you're not experiencing that salvation and that joy today, know that you can have it. The prophets of old were looking forward to what was to come. You can look forward to what God will do in your life. And that helps you take a step forward. And it helps you trust. And it helps you experience joy. Because my friends, joy points forward. It points to what is to come. And maybe it won't happen today, and maybe you won't even fully experience joy tomorrow. And maybe, maybe joy, you'll only get glimpses of it until that day comes where you're called home to heaven. But joy points us forward. And so, friends, let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on our Savior Jesus the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Because the joy that points us forward was the joy that pointed him forward. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross for you and for me. He scorned the shame of it. He was seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So let us consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that we will not grow weary or lose heart. Friends, may joy point us forward. And when life gets difficult, and when opposition comes, and maybe it's in your life right now, know that for the joy set before us in Christ, it is all worth it. Do not grow weary, and do not lose heart. And my friends, don't stop living for God. If you'll pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, that we can experience joy And that we can also look forward forward to the joy that is to come. We thank you for Jesus, who took our place and died our death, who endured so much. Because he knew. He knew, God, what you would do. Help us to be like Christ and trust you, God, as our Father. Help us to look to Jesus as our example. And help us, God, to not grow weary or lose heart. Help us to faithfully live every day, sharing our faith, sharing the love that we have, sharing your light with all that we meet. And when we fail or when we mess up, when life gets discouraging, God, help us to not turn from you. Instead, may joy well up inside of us and remind us, God, that you are with us. We pray all this in the name of our mighty, saving Savior, Jesus. Amen. Church family, if you'll stand with me, we will close today by singing a hymn.